the spectacular 42-kilometer stretch of clean, sandy surfing beaches stretching from South Stradbroke Island to Coolangatta is the key to one of the world's largest tourist resort cities, the Gold Coast. Every year, over three million overnight visitors and countless numbers of day trippers come to the Gold Coast to enjoy its leisure and entertainment facilities, its balmy subtropical climate, and its magnificent beaches. Many Australians who grew up by the beach take the coastline of this vast continent for granted. It is, however, an invaluable national asset from the point of tourism, recreational use, and the environment. To protect the coastal zone, careful and often costly management is necessary to make sure the long-term stability of this national asset is preserved. The Gold Coast has been a booming growth area over the past few decades, and over the last century, development has been focused along the ocean foreshore, with the most intensive tourist development pressures of any area in Australia. Tourism and associated developments have created coastal zone management problems, and quite considerable coastal engineering works have been carried out to protect the Gold Coast beaches. The rolling surf is an undoubted attraction for locals and visitors, but the high average wave energy, predominantly from the southeast, which causes these conditions, also creates a so-called longshore transportation, a virtual river of sand moving an average of half a million cubic meters northwards along the beach every year. The Gold Coast beach system is at times extremely dynamic, but in the long term, evidence from detailed research over the years shows that there generally appears to be a state of equilibrium. During cyclonic conditions, waves over 11 meters in height have been recorded. And in these conditions, the active beach extends several kilometers seaward and can intrude landward temporarily, if unrestrained, for hundreds of meters. However, nature has its own way of protecting the beach, and the sand eroded from the beaches forms a protective offshore storm bar, reducing the energy of the waves reaching the beach. During subsequent calmer conditions, the sand bar is moved back on shore to restore the beach over a period of up to 18 months. Of course, extreme conditions don't occur all the time, and it's easy to understand how early settlers built on the active dune areas when there was little to warn them of potential cyclonic erosion. Settlement in this area started in the late 1800s, and much of the foreshore land was subdivided in the early part of this century, well before the environmental impact was known, and local authority controls, as we now know them, were in place. The small coastal resort settlements gradually merged into a continuous ribbon of tourist oriented development, stretching north from Coolangatta on the Queensland-New South Wales border to Main Beach at the north. As the area developed, erosion became an increasing problem. Historical records of beachfronts show that cyclones caused severe erosion, particularly in 1936 and 1954. Even after these cyclones, recovery of the beaches occurred quickly. However, in 1962, the New South Wales government extended the rock training walls at the mouth of the Tweed River, interfering with the natural northerly flow of sand, and ultimately trapping millions of cubic metres that would have flowed onto the southern Gold Coast beaches. Prior to the training walls, there had been large offshore shoals that protected the beaches in this area. With the starvation of sand, these shoals were quickly eroded. There was so much concern about the future of the Gold Coast beaches that in 1964, the Delft Laboratories in Holland were commissioned by the Queensland Government to advise on a major coastal engineering study of the Gold Coast beaches. Then, in 1967, disaster Fifteen miles of beachfront on the Queensland coast, but it took only one week of pounding waves whipped up by 70 mile an hour gale force winds to remove all the glitter from this famous playground. Relentlessly, the breakers ate away the sand, undermined holiday homes, luxurious guest houses and modern flats. Promenades crumbled and disappeared in the swirling foam. Some homes toppled, disintegrated to become flotsam. More than a thousand teenagers, housewives, business people and tourists Join forces in the battle against Mother Nature in her most savage mood. 
Hundreds of trucks, bulldozers and other earth-moving vehicles are employed in the desperate battle to stem the erosion. Soldiers from the Jungle Training School at Canungra are dispatched to join the volunteer army. More than 50,000 sandbags are filled and dumped in the path of the waves. These ramparts were reinforced with old cars and trucks, and when the gale winds subsided, the high tides extended the devastation. It seemed inevitable that the Gold Coast was doomed. A preliminary estimate of damage along the 15-mile stretch was $5 million. Many believe the final count will be far in excess of that staggering figure. But no sooner had the seas dropped when the task of restoring the beach front had begun. Queensland's Premier Nicklin visited the scene, described it as calamitous and promised immediate financial aid. Gold Coast Mayor Bruce Small hopes for federal government assistance and reports that for most of the Gold Coast, it's already business as usual. Surfers Paradise is Australia's most popular holiday centre, but it could have been a paradise lost. Massive boulder walls constructed at Coolangatta, Broad Beach and Surfers Paradise formed the last line of defence against the storm attack and narrowly averted a total disaster. In 1970, the Delft report was completed, providing coastal engineers with the first detailed analysis of what was happening to the beaches, what could be expected in the future, and the works needed to protect the Gold Coast. Although there was more information and proposed solutions to hand, methods had to be developed to carry out the recommendations, and funding required for the work was not available. In 1972, further cyclones caused severe erosion, particularly at the southern end of the coast, and the Kira Point groin was built to protect Coolangatta Beach, and another groin to stabilise Corumban. The changed behaviour on the southern Gold Coast beaches due to the effect of the tweed training walls was becoming obvious. The nearshore shoals had been eroded. Now larger, more oblique waves were reaching the beach during storms. A year later, the campground at Kira was washed into the sea and a boulder wall had to be built to prevent the loss of the Gold Coast Highway. It was becoming increasingly apparent that implementation of the Delft report was an urgent priority. The state government appointed the Gold Coast City Council to implement the report with a 25% funding subsidy. The 1974 cyclones hastened council's plan. At the northern end, 1.3 million cubic metres of sand was pumped from the stable sand reserves in the Namrang estuary, using a 27-inch suction dredge to take it up to 5 kilometres to Main Beach and Surfers Paradise. Another 250,000 cubic metres was pumped from Corumban estuary onto Palm Beach using a 10-inch dredge, and a further 900,000 cubic metres was pumped from the Tweed estuary to Kira Beach. In 1976, a further nourishment program added another 270,000 cubic metres of sand to the Spit, Palm Beach and Burley. And the first stage of Tullabudgera groin was built to stabilise North Palm Beach. There are several reasons why we're going to stop pumping, but uh, in a nutshell, we're finding it too, too costly on the ratepayers. In 1980, after several years of severe erosion problems, the Queensland Government initiated further beach protection work with the construction of the mini groins at Palm Beach. More protection work was carried out in 1981 when the Corumban training wall was constructed to stabilise the creek mouth which had previously silted. This allowed a further 325,000 cubic metres of sand to be pumped to Palm Beach, eliminating any adverse impact of the groins. Palm Beach was nourished with 325,000 cubic metres of sand at a cost of $650,000. Over the period from 1983 to 1985, the beachfront was subjected to more punishment when storms caused further erosion damage, particularly along the southern beaches. It was clear that the quantity of sand placed in 1974 was inadequate to deal with the ongoing erosion caused by the Tweed Walls. 
Because of these continuing problems, research was initiated into how they could be solved with the start of the Point Danger Tweed River investigation and a detailed study into Kira erosion. This period saw the construction by the Gold Coast Waterways Authority of both the Southport Seaway training walls to stabilize the Narang River entrance and the complementary sand bypassing system to prevent disruption of the northerly sand flow. Further works were carried out in 1985 with major nourishment programs which saw 1.2 million cubic meters of sand pumped from various sources. While the northern beaches were nourished with sand from channel maintenance works in the Broadwater associated with the seaway construction, the southern beaches were nourished using stable, compatible offshore reserves, for the first time using the Belgian dredge Vlanderen 20. These works incorporated nearshore nourishment as well as conventional onshore placement to restore the eroded seabed. Mild conditions in 1986 and 1987 gave the beaches some respite and allowed dune fencing work to be done to provide a measure of protection. In 1988, a further 1.5 million cubic meters of sand was dredged from offshore reserves using the Australian-based trailing suction hopper dredge Resolution and deposited nearshore off Kira Balinga Beach at a cost of $2.5 million. However, summer storms in 1989 ripped even more precious sand away to the north of the nourished area and concerned residents held public meetings. The nourishment works carried out significantly restored the nearshore seabed between Kira and Kurumban and protected the beach during storms. The artificial bar created not only protected the beach during the subsequent storm, but also moved shoreward, allowing beaches to accrete in front of the boulder wall. However, after the storms, a sand deficit still existed in this area and it was essential to overcome this shortage. Otherwise, the hole in the sand reserves would travel northwards, resulting in loss of beaches and further damage to seafront property. In 1989, the Queensland government made a commitment to providing adequate funds for a beach restoration program to tackle the erosion problems. The Queensland government initiated works in April 1989 to provide interim protection to the endangered properties by placing 50,000 cubic metres of sand on the offshore bar using the Port of Brisbane dredge Sir Thomas Hiley. Tenders were called for stage one of the Southern Gold Coast Beach Nourishment Project in August 1989, with 75% of the funding provided by the state government. Initially, stage one involved bringing 2.4 million cubic meters of sand from offshore to be deposited in the nearshore and onshore area to provide an adequate sand buffer against all but extreme storm wave attack. The $12 million tender was awarded to Westham Dredging, who had carried out the nearshore nourishment in 1988. Works commenced in November, utilizing the shallow draft resolution to place 396,000 cubic meters in the nearshore section by bottom dumping procedures. The onshore section commenced in mid-January 1990, utilizing the large modern Dutch dredge Ham 310, which had been previously working in Hong Kong. This dredge carries up to 7,000 cubic meters per load and is equipped with modern position fixing equipment to allow accurate location of the dredge in a 24-hour-a-day operation. To enable the sand to be pumped ashore, a 900-meter-long steel pipeline was fabricated on site to be towed into position. This pipeline was moved as the works progressed. Once the dredge hopper was loaded, the dredge arms were raised and the dredge steamed to the mooring buoy at the seaward end of the pipeline. Sand was then pumped ashore and distributed along the nourished beach. With only some 70,000 cubic meters placed after two weeks of dredging, Cyclone Nancy moved down the Queensland coast, causing waves up to 11.6 meters to be recorded off the Gold Coast. The effectiveness of the profile nourishment method was well tried and proven, with only minor redistribution of the onshore nourishment occurring. The initial 2.4 million cubic meters reprovided a wide, usable beach. The contract was able to be extended to allow a further 1.2 million cubic meters to be placed north of Kira Point. This restored the beaches in the area and provided a short-term reservoir. A further 2 million cubic meters of sand will still be needed to replace all of the sand reserves lost from the active system at the southern end of the Gold Coast and to restore the original beach and seabed profile. With the southern beaches restored, 
it will be essential for full supply to southern beaches to be provided. The ongoing investigation into the complex mechanisms at the Tweed Mouth will provide the answer as to whether further works to compensate for losses such as artificial sand bypassing or maintenance nourishment from offshore is required. More nourishment works are required, however, along the other Gold Coast beaches to provide an adequate sand buffer against storm wave attack. Surfers Paradise Beach, nourished in 1974, for example, has weathered numerous storms, but further work is still required to establish an adequate cyclone buffer. The expertise gained by Council's active involvement in the implementation and monitoring of protection works and research into local coastal processes has been considerable. This has led to the evolution of more efficient methods of coastal protection works and complementary management policies. To augment Council's long-term nourishment program, all excess clean sand excavated from building sites within 500 metres of the beach must be placed on the beach. This sand must be vegetated and fenced by the developer to provide a dune storm buffer and some three quarters of a million cubic meters of sand has been placed on the beaches in this way since implementation of the policy in 1985. To ensure protection of foreshore developments in extreme conditions, Council also requires that all beachfront buildings be protected by a boulder wall. And if over three stories, it must be piled to resist scour if the boulder wall is breached. With increased recreational usage, the dune buffer areas can no longer be maintained in their natural state. Removable boardwalks are being installed, which allow controlled usage of these areas, but do not reduce the reservoir of sand to buffer erosion. Foreshore protection works also need to be carried out along the extensive public foreshores of the natural waterways within the city. Council is also responsible for the maintenance of the city's 60 kilometres of residential canal foreshores and channels, and the coastal engineering expertise gained is also applied in these areas. However, much is still to be learned, and more and more information is continually being added to the store of data already in use in helping to understand and protect the city's beaches and waterways.